a few years ago, I was in southernmost Louisiana. Um, for those of you who haven't been, uh, southernmost Louisiana is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Um, it is. It has an incredibly unique uh, culture and ecology. Um, it is also suffering land loss at the rate of a football field every hour. Uh, it's one of the biggest climate change disasters on earth, uh, and it's not talked about nearly enough. Um, and it's, it's caused by, by many things. It's caused by um, um, saltwater intrusion, rising sea levels, hundreds of miles of oil and gas pipelines that tear up the land. The end result is that this is a place that is literally disappearing into the water. Um, and I was working as a journalist at the time, uh, and so I was down there writing a story. Um, and I was interviewing people. I was interviewing people born and raised in this part of the world. And I had, I had a particular conversation that sticks in my mind that um, I think will sound familiar to any recent immigrants in the room. Um, I was talking to this gentleman, and he asked me at one point uh, where I was from. And I gave him an answer. And um, apparently the answer was not satisfactory, because then he said, no, no, where are you really from? Uh, and then we did that little song and dance where we moved backwards until we finally got to Egypt, which is where I'm, I was born. Um, and when I said this, he nodded and he said, um, you know, I could hear the Egyptian on your accent. <laughs> and it was one of those moments where, and these happen quite frequently, where I became keenly aware of the sense of being unanchored. Um, you know, I'm introduced as Omar al Akkad, but that's not my name. My name is Omar Muhammad Laed, which includes letters that are unpronounceable in the English language. Um, I was, I sound like this. I grew up in the Middle East. Uh, I was born in Egypt, but I lived there for only five years. Um, I grew up on an, an American cultural diet. Um, and the reason I tell this story is because the book I'm about to tell you about is, is it's many things. It's, it's a chronicle of ecological disaster, of war of um, the kind of polarization that seems very, very relevant in America today, uh, but has actually been around for, for a very long time in this country. Um, but it's also a book about the sense of unbelonging. Um, and it's an account of what happens at the extreme end of that unbelonging, when somebody is forcibly stripped of their sense of place. Um, so the novel is called American War. It is an account of a fictional second American Civil War that takes place about five or six decades from now. Um, the America of that time period is a very different place. Uh, the coastlines have effectively disappeared thanks to rising sea levels. Florida is underwater. Um, the storms are much, much bigger and stronger. And to escape these storms, about 100 million people have moved inland. Uh, the capital has been moved from DC to Columbus. Um, and long after it would do any good at all, the, um, the federal government decides to impose a prohibition on fossil fuels as a way to combat all of this. Uh, by this point in time, um, most of the world has moved on to other sources of fuel. Uh, nonetheless, a number of southern states decide that they would rather secede than go along with this. Uh, what follows is a uh, second civil war, the kinetic part of which does not last very long at all. The South loses, again. Um, and, um, where's the exits? Um, OK. okay. Um, and, uh, and what follows that is, is uh, years of insurgency. Um, and the novel takes place during those years of insurgency. Uh, and it follows the lives of a single family, the Chestnuts, who, when we first meet them, are living in a repurposed shipping container in southernmost Louisiana uh, by the shore of the Mississippi Sea, which is what the Mississippi River has now become. Um, in particular, it is the story of the life of a single character, Surratt Chestnut, and it's the story of what the war does to her. Um, I'm often asked um, why I decided to write this book. And one of the fun things you get to do when you're an author is you get to come up with uh, a very clean Genesis story. Uh, this happened, this happened, then I wrote a book. Uh, it's never like that. But um, the, the closest I can come to a, sort of, to a sort of Genesis moment for writing this particular novel um, has to do with a very vague recollection I have now from many years ago of watching an interview with a foreign affairs expert, um, one of those talking heads that uh, news outlets occasionally bring in to, to explain the world. Um, and I don't remember if it was on CNN or one of the other networks, but it had taken place in the immediate aftermath of a set of protests in Afghanistan. Local villagers were protesting against the US military presence there. And one of the questions that was put to this gentleman was something like, why do they hate us so much? 
And as part of his answer, he noted that um, sometimes the special forces have to go into these villages and conduct nighttime raids looking for insurgents. And that when they do this, they'll sometimes ransack the houses or hold the women and children at gunpoint. Um, and then he helpfully added, um, and you know, in Afghan culture, that sort of thing is considered very offensive. I thought, you know, name me one culture on earth that wouldn't consider this sort of thing offensive. Uh, and that's when I first started thinking about this idea of taking the, the elements of the conflicts that have defined the world in my lifetime. And these are conflicts in which US involvement has either been indirect or from a great distance, and recasting them as elements of something close to home. And I couldn't think of anything closer to home than a civil war where you're fighting yourself in the heart of the dominant empire in the world. Um, I started writing the book in the, in the summer of 2014. Um, I finished the first draft almost exactly a year later. Um, and about three weeks after that, Donald Trump announced he was running for president. And ever since then, the, the prism through which this novel has been seen has been very different from the situation when I, when I wrote it. Um, what I intended was, was to write a defense of, of empathy. Um, and I wanted to write a defense of the idea that there's no such thing as a foreign form of suffering. That those people all the way over there aren't reacting to all of this in some kind of fundamentally exotic way. Um, that the privilege of assuming that is just that. It's a privilege of living in a relatively peaceful part of the world. Um, but the novel came out in, in April of last year. Um, and has been looked at a lot in, in terms of, of you know, it's been described as this uh, speculative uh, dystopia. Um, you know, Orson Scott Card, the guy who wrote um, Ender's Game, once said that the way you tell uh, a science fiction novel from a fantasy novel is you look at the front cover. And if there's rivets and metal and stuff, then it's science fiction. If there's forests and streams, then it's, then it's fantasy. I think a lot of people read the back cover of this book and saw 2075 and Second Civil War and thought, oh, dystopia, speculative. Um, that wasn't that wasn't what I intended. Um, uh, for for obvious reasons, I can't I can't ever know if this is a depiction of of what could be somebody else's future. Um, but I can tell you that it was based on somebody else's present. Um, and I didn't invent many of the things that populate this book. I didn't invent drone killings or waterboarding or refugee camps. Uh, I simply made them a little harder to look away from. Um, much of the book is based on the 10 years I spent as a journalist. I, um, I got my start in journalism in 2006 at the Globe and Mail, which is Canada's national newspaper. Um, I was hired full time on a Monday, I believe, and on that Friday, Canada had the largest terrorism arrests in its history. Um, it's called the Toronto 18 case. And I was on that story for about two years. And um, it was essentially the story of how some, you know, a bunch of kids living in the suburbs of Toronto become radicalized to the point where they're building homemade detonators on, you know, off YouTube videos. Um, later on, I, I went to uh, Afghanistan. I covered the, the invasion there. Um, and much of what I saw in places like Afghanistan populates the, the novel. One of my earliest experiences, I showed up in Afghanistan, I was about 25 years old, and I was filled with that combination of obliviousness and idiocy that young men mistake for courage. And I, th I had this very Hemingway and sense of what war would be like. But my defining experience early on, the very first experience that actually stuck, was leaving the NATO airfield. The NATO airfield is, is a small city, very, very well defended at its core by NATO troops. That's the inner wire. The outer wire is defended by 18-year-old Afghan soldiers with leftover Russian weapons from 30 years ago. Um, every attack hits the outer wire. Almost no attack makes it into the inner wire. And there was no way to look at that situation and come to any conclusion other than the clarity with which wartime displays this notion that some lives are more dispensable than others. And that's the sort of stuff that, that informed the book. Um, I was in Guantanamo Bay eight times covering the, the pretrial hearings there. Uh, and much of what I saw there in terms of the camps themselves, but also the military bureaucracy that was created overnight to oversee it, also makes its way into the book. Um, and for a long time, I had, I had almost all the makings of this novel, um, but I didn't know where to start it. I didn't know where in America I wanted to start it. Uh, and then I went on that assignment to Louisiana. And uh, I saw this place 
this incredibly beautiful place, this incredibly beautiful mix of cultures literally disappearing. Um, and so the reason I, d I decided to, to start the book in, in southernmost Louisiana um, had to do with this notion that I was writing this book about the universality of revenge and about the universality of, of reactions to injustice and how everybody reacts the same way to being on not only the losing end of the war, but, but on the wrong side of injustice. Um, but I was also writing a book concerned with the way during my lifetime that America, you know, the things that America has done in the world and the things that America had done to the world. And so it seemed fitting to, to set the story, to open the story in this place where the world was doing something to America. Um, it's a book about many, many things, um, but I hope it's seen as a defense of, of nuance and a defense of this idea that it's important to understand why somebody does something, even something terrible, um, without taking their side, um, which I think is this notion that in the last 17 years has been obliterated um, from public thought here. Um, and I'm coming up on 13 seconds to closing, so I will thank you so much for your patience. Enjoy the rest of the talks.